this new worship today. Today is the second Sunday in Lent, <clears throat> February the 25th, 2024. Our service begins on page 94, page 94 with the gathering confession and forgiveness. Please stand if you are able. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are connected to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, forgive us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn today is hymn number 617. 617, we come to you. As 
as with Noah, God makes an everlasting covenant with Abraham and Sarah. God promises this old couple that they will be the ancestors of nations. Though they have no ch child together, God will miraculously bring forth new life from Sarah's womb. The name changes emphasize the firmness of God's promise. Our reading today is from Genesis 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abraham fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her so, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Here ends the first reading. Thanks be to God. Paul presents Abraham as the example for how a person must come into a right relationship with God, not through works of the law, but through faith. Though Abraham and Sarah were far too old for bearing children, Abraham trusted that God would accomplish what God had promised to accomplish. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be their heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be granted to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. <clears throat> Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a <clears throat> hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words that was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Here ends the second reading.
Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, again he would rise. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If any want to become my, my followers, let them deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what it profit to gain the whole world and forget their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? The, those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of then the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Here ends the, the Gospel of the Lord. Our texts this morning are about a continuation of what we've done as we begin the Lenten season. It's about our faith, our faith in God. In the first lesson, we see the faith of Abraham and Sarah. God makes with them a covenant. That word covenant is found in agreement. And it's not only the first covenant, God makes many covenants with his people. One of those covenants was when Christ sat down with his disciples and shared the Holy Supper with them. That was a new covenant that Jesus made. So there are many covenants that God makes to remind us that we are his people and that he will be our God. But it centers on that whole idea of faith. Now can you imagine Peter and Sarah, Abraham, Abraham and Sarah being a hundred years old and giving birth to a son? That all happened because, once again, their faith in God. And that first lesson identifies that. Then the second lesson that's picked up once again, that the promise of those who have faith in God will, once again, be blessed, will be righteous, will have gifts abundant upon them. And that's the point that that, that second lesson makes. And then in the gospel, you've probably heard this many, many times. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, and he will be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and will be killed, and three days rise again. Now here we see good old Peter, who's supposed to be uh, the greatest partner with Jesus, rebukes Jesus. Says, I don't believe that. See that 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 nip, that nugget of faith there again? Even Peter wavers from his faith because he does not believe that Jesus needs to be suffered, that Jesus needs to do anything. That if Jesus is really the Son of God, he can do anything he wants. Why would he have to suffer? It made no sense to Peter, and it made no sense to the disciples why Jesus must suffer. And so Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now, can you imagine how Peter felt at that time? Get behind me, Satan, because you're not thinking right. That's why Peter was challenged at that point. Get behind me, because you're not thinking right. And many times we're not thinking right. We talked about that last week. We don't always have our head wrapped around our faith. We seem to do things that aren't always faithful. And yet that's why we come here, to kind of get our heads straightened out. I hope we do, too. That we kind of have to remember what we're about. And that's why, once again, you many people say, well, what do I have to go to church for? You know, even once a week. It's to get our heads straight out. That's why we go. It's to get this, this noggin. Because we have stinking thinking, I call it. We don't always think correctly. Because we think from the mind and not from the heart. The heart is where Jesus and God rest 
and the Holy Spirit. It's not in the head. And we have a lot of head knowledge. Just think about that. We have a lot of head knowledge. A Lutheran pastor has to go not only have a degree, a bachelor's degree, but four years more to get his master's degree. And so that's a lot, a lot, a lot of training. And then if you want to get a doctor, it's two more years. For instance, I've spent 20 years in education, or 23, I think it is. It's a lot of mind, isn't it? Training of the mind. But one thing that was missed, I think, in all that training was the ministry of the heart. Now, not only did we train the mind, so we, we kind of missed the heart. And that's where it all begins, to love people. You know, there are so many, once again, rules and regulation in the church. And we use those rules, we're even taught those rules in seminary. You know, what, what you should do as a pastor and what you shouldn't do. And how, how, once again, you have to obey the rules. For instance, one of those is, is the blessing of the cup that I'm not here. And many people have called, called me out on that. And once again, you know, as long as, as you're here and I give the blessing, then that is the body and blood of Christ. You know, that's, that's what, what happens. The bishop does that as well when he anoints people in the parish. And they, they may be lay people that are serving that parish. He grants them uh, that grace, that, that obligation to bless the elements. It may not be what you feel is right, but once again, we have so many rules and regulations in the church. Another one that bothers me a lot is one of those that if, if you don't give or attend worship within a year, you're taken off the roll. Period. That's it. I never agreed with that because I think that one who's lost like that should remain on the roll more than anybody else. But that's not always the way it goes. I can remember my first parish, they would have a meeting and every year in January, we would go through the roster in our council meeting and see, I had to report, have they been in worship or haven't they? <coughs> have they given a contribution? The treasurer would come in with a list of those who had not given a contribution. And I always say to people, you know, all you gotta do is come to one worship and give one dollar. <laughs> and you know, that's, but that's, that's the rules and regulations of the church. We have a constitution that's that thick on the rules and regulations of the church. And we once again forget, I think, our faith. You know, it shouldn't go here, it shouldn't go up here. That's my point. I, I don't, don't always agree with all the rules and regulations. We all have them. There isn't a, a denomination that doesn't have them. Um, and, and many times we're always called upon them when things aren't going right. It seems that's called upon more than people wanting to know about their faith, wanting to know about scripture. Many people know more about the Constitution than they know about the Word of God. And that's kind of where Peter was standing, wasn't he? Peter wasn't standing on his heart. He was kind of going back to the Constitution, so to speak. You know, why, Lord, do you have to suffer? Why, Lord, do you have to go through these things? You're God, you're part of God. It's almost like our lesson last week with Satan telling him what? Jesus, you know, I'll give you the kingdom. All you have to do is worship me. I'll give you food. All you have to do is worship me. Crawl off this edge of the mountain, this edge of the cliff, and I will save you. See that stinking thinking that once again, that, that happens. Now most of us might have done what Jesus didn't do. And that's fall into that trap that Jesus or that Satan set for us. But Jesus didn't. He said three times, get behind me, Satan. Notice what he says to Peter. Same thing. Get behind me, Satan. I find that rather ironical, isn't it? Peter was one that trusted and loved the Lord. And yet Jesus said the same thing to him as he said to Satan. Not only once, but he said that three times to Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. And here we see in, the, in, in this lesson today, 
Uh, Jesus sang the Peter just behind him says, We need to say that time and time again because Satan is real, he's out there, and he wants us, he wants all of us. Don't ever get fooled. Just because you sit in the pew and go, go, to, go to church, that he's after us more than people who don't. The people who don't have already been cast away. What I mean is they have already believed that there is that, that God isn't real, or you know, whatever that may be, however they but there's a reason they're not here. There's a reason they're not here. I don't know what that reason may be, but there's a reason they're not in worship. There just is. There's a reason for that. And many times when I would go to the houses of these people who once again didn't come, you would hear them say time and time again, Well, the church hurt me in many ways. And they would go on to share what that hurt would be. But it was usually the congregation that someone said to them something that, to them, that offended them. Now, I don't know how true that is, but you know, that's, that's usually what was said to me that someone said something that offended me. I can remember when I first came here where Priscilla and our friends are sitting in that pew. There was an older woman that sat there, Irene. And when somebody came in, like you, sat there, and she, got, she came in to sit, and she said, that's my sweet Mary. And that's where she sat for years. But if somebody ever got in there, watch out. And, and it was a guest, and of course they never came back. See how our words can really cut? And that's why we have to say time and time again in our, our daily prayers, get behind me, Satan. Luther struggled with that more than anyone else. Luther struggled with that Satan was after him. And that's why he went to writing. He wrote so many times and when he was uh, in the work, work, work for Castle, is where he was writing all of these books on 55 volumes. He wrote a book on every uh, book in the Bible. He wrote a, a book on that, that thick, 55 volumes of writings. And he would throw the inkwell against the wall time and time again because he thought Satan was after him. I don't want you to believe that Satan is after you, but Satan is real. Satan is there. And Satan is a part of this life. And you'll find Satan wherever you are. You know, just look at our communities, how they're, they're once again ravaged by drugs and illegal operations. And, you know, none of us are immune from that. We can move away. We can move away from it, but we'll never, we'll never get all the way away. You know, we'll just look what Lake Park has done. You know, they closed off First and Second Street, well, not First, but Second and Third Street. So, you know, hoping that, that once again, the part of Red River Beach wouldn't come over this way. But they do. You can't stop people from where they're going to live. And so, once again, we need to understand that Satan is alive and well, but that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit will bring us through that. You must just have that in a promise. That is a covenant, an agreement, once again, that God makes with us. I will be your God if you will be my people, which is another covenant, another agreement that God makes with us. Like I said, it's not just one agreement that God made. He made many agreements that tell us how much he loves us. God loves you so much that he gave his only son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have the gift of everlasting life. Amen.